Welcome to First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis, the birthplace of congregational humanism. We carry on that tradition of free thought today, dedicated to promoting a free search for truth, meaning, and justice. Our web address is firstunitarian.org. I'm David Breeden, Senior Minister. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm the Reverend Dr. David Breeden, Senior Minister at First Unitarian Society, and I'm coming to you live today so that we can uh, have uh, our staff and volunteers take a day off, except for a special thanks to Secular North, uh, Justice Bovey and Jacob Mullis um, did help us today to do that and are behind the controls helping out and uh, but any of the mess ups, I uh, believe me, are my fault. Uh, not all that technical, but we'll see if I can uh, hit the right buttons. Now, this is a special um, little Labor Day weekend thing. Uh, I don't didn't want to have anybody else have to do anything, so there's no social hour after um, the assembly today. Um, and uh, so, you know, go forth and have a great picnic, uh, as we'll be talking about. A couple things not to forget. Don't forget about registering for Retreat to the Woods, which is coming up October 1st through the 3rd. Um, I sent a, uh, a, a link for that this morning in the exchange, if you get the FUS exchange. If not, go to our website, firstunitarian.org, and you can search for Retreat to the Woods, and you'll find that page. Also, the deadline for sending us water photos is Wednesday. So Wednesday, uh, we'll be starting to get the slides together for next Sunday. Uh, so please uh, send us some water sli uh, slides. Yeah, you buy the water, uh, your favorite place uh, with water and that kind of thing. So today is a special question box um, uh, assembly. Um, I've done that this summer uh, for at the beginning of the summer and then on the 4th of July and now for today, um, again, to help out with staff uh, and, and let everybody have a nice holiday weekend. But let's uh, get uh, to it, and I will begin to share some slides here uh, to, to cover some of our questions. So... One of the questions, uh, let's get just right to, to it here, is how can we prevent the USA from turning into a fascist dictatorship a la Huxley's Brave New World? How's that for a simple question? So, but, you know, no questions too big or too small. So uh, do you do want to take a little shot at that and, and uh, see uh, what we can do with that. And uh, so here I am to try. Well, first off, we do need to go to what the heck is Brave New World. Um, well, it was a novel back in 1932 from Aldous Huxley, a British writer, um, and it was written in 1931. Now, why is that important? It's important because uh, he was watching the rise of the fascist dictatorships in Europe. He was also watching fascism on the rise in Great Britain, uh, and where he was, and also, of course, uh, it was on the rise here in the U.S. as well. We kind of conveniently forget that at, the, at this point, but out of the Great Depression, the slump, as they call it in Europe, uh, comes uh, all of these uh, fascist ideas, and a lot of people begin to fall into the, uh, become enamored of fascism. Why? Well, because it makes the economy run on time and the train run on time. And indeed, that is what Huxley decided was really kind of the problem. Huxley concluded that fascist movements of his day were all about comfort. So that's what he's talking about in Brave New World, even though it's pretty hidden under uh, the uh, science fiction elements. And uh, uh, he was uh, very much a satirical writer. But that's really the underlay is uh, how can we talk about a world that is democratic, that works on liberal de democratic principles um, in this time period when people are so upset uh, with the economics of the day. Well, yeah, 
that sure does seem a lot like what is going on today, doesn't it? Um, a lot of people talk about fascism, fascism. Yeah. Um, the default if for a lot of the liberal democracies over time, uh, especially in Europe, but here in the U.S. as well, uh, has been to when they get nervous, let's let's go to some kind of a strong leader. Um, we should look for a little background here. This just came out from the Pew Research. Most white Americans who regularly attend worship services voted for Trump in 2020. This is part and parcel of what's going on here. Uh, you'll also notice that at the uh, little subsection here, black voters overwhelmingly supported Biden in 2020, regardless of how often they attend religious services. But uh, yes, most white Americans who attend some sort of worship service regularly went for Trump in 2020, as they had in 2016. Why is there, is there some kind of correlation between looking for a strong man, let, you know, let's be nice and not call it fascism at the moment, I suppose. Why is that correlated as very strongly with uh, especially evangelical religions? That's a good point. Um, but uh, this came out uh, today, this morning on Religious News Network. Trump and his religion advisors launched new National Faith Advisory Board. Acknowledged he, acknowledging he lost Catholic voters over his presidency, the former president referenced hypothetical future scenarios if we're able to get back in. So uh, a new faith-based uh, advisory board has been formed. Um, and away it goes, and what is it going to try to do but try to re, um, re-win some of the religious uh, right that did abandon Trump. Uh, one of the interesting things, those of you, of you who watch demographics know that the only group that actually went down in percentage points of voting for Trump between 16 and 20 uh, was uh, white men. Uh, all other groups did go up in terms of the, their voting for Trump. Again, an interesting phenomenon. Uh, lots of speculation as to why that's true, but it just happened. But definitely Christian faith, uh, a right of a right-wing variety, is very much part of this uh, whole uh, way of thinking. I would, if you're very interested in these things, recommend a book called American Prophets. Uh, the Religious Roots of Progressive Politics and the Ongoing Fight for the Soul of the Country by Jack Jenkins. It's a very recent book. Uh, it's brilliant. Um, and look, trying to take a look at the religious left, uh, the religious progressives who are trying to counterbalance the religious right. Um, that is a problem. And uh, the numbers aren't there at the present time to counterbalance those two. Um, but then secular people do figure into the balance, and most secular people are over on the more progressive side. So if we can get a religious left, quote unquote, uh, mobilized, and, and then with the, um, uh, with the more secular people, of which about 25% of the electorate now is, well, uh, maybe we can uh, redo some kind of a coalition that might uh, fight um, the uh, brave new world that may or may not be coming in the U.S. And uh, so well, we're going to hope so. Uh, but certainly uh, organizations like the Unitarian Universalist Association, American Humanist Association, um, as we'll see later, these organizations are definitely trying to keep uh, the civil liberties going um, in the face of uh, uh, very quickly changing right-wing um, uh, ideas such as, oh, the Supreme Court, which we learned just this week. There's another book, and by golly, our uh, Big Read book group is going to be reading this this year coming up. Thomas Frank, you probably know him, at least uh, you've read articles about him, because he was the author of What's the Matter with Kansas? Why are people voting red when their interests are actually blue, etc.? And at this you know, how is this happening? Um, uh, very good sociology in that book. Uh, he has a new book called The People Know, A Brief History of Anti-Populism. 
Now, this is one of the more interesting things that is going on here. And again, if you want to look back at Brave New World and the reason that Huxley wrote it, it's, he wrote it because he de determined that fascism happens when people want to be comfortable. They choose comfort over thinking or comfort over agitating or comfort over arguing politics anymore. Uh, Thomas Frank is going to say that populism is getting a bad name and we really need to start looking at what's happening in the streets of America um, because the liberal elites on both sides of the issue are probably out of touch with what's really going on with the heartbeat of most Americans. Uh, so that's that's what he's talking about. I've only read the blurbs about it, but it looks like a very good book. And you can join in with our Big Read book group, uh, taking a look at The People Know, A Brief History of Anti-Populism. Another book that I haven't read, but I intend to, it hasn't come out yet, but it is on its way out from Cornell University Press, is Anti-Fascism, The Course of a Crusade by Paul Gottfried. Um, I'll, look, I'll read a little bit of this blurb just to give you an idea of where this is going. In Anti-Fascism, Gottfried concludes that promoting a fear of fascism today serves the interest of the powerful, in particular those in positions of political, journalistic, and educational power who want to bully and isolate political opponents. Uh, you're getting the idea here that when we begin to talk about fascism as the big uh, danger, uh, what we're doing is we're frightening out uh, other people who um, maybe have some more conservative views, but certainly don't conser consider themselves fascist in any way. He points out that the generous support given to the intersectional left by multinational capitalists and examines the movement of the white working class in Europe, including former members of communist parties, toward the populist right, suggesting this shows a political dynamic that that is different from the older dialectic between Marxists and anti-Marxists. So here in the U.S., we still, in many ways, see politics as a Cold War era thing. Um, here are, are our extremes on the left. Here are extremes on the right, the vast middle. But that vast middle is what has changed, probably, and the left and the right, in the extremes anyway, are probably not what they looked like 40 years ago during the Cold War. And this, uh, we really need to begin to think about that if uh, we want to reestablish some kind of a political uh, a group, some, some kind of coalition that can work against uh, what uh, we see as a right-wing uh, turn. So, yep, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Um, he predicted a lot of things that did come true. Soma, as some of you remember from reading from the book, people would rather be drugged and happy than think. Uh, yeah, and we have a lot more ways to be drugged and happy these days than the, they did in 1931. But comfort, uh, again, is one of those things that uh, uh, doesn't change about the human psyche, I'm afraid. And we do need to be watching out uh, for people who are looking for comfort rather than what I would, I guess I would call, you know, the, the hurly-burly, the, the uh, difficulty of actually having a functioning democracy. So a lot to think about, but one of the things we do need to think about, I, I believe, is that the political lines have um, changed irretrievably and we really need to change our way of thinking about how those are working these days. All of the questions today kind of had a similar idea here. This one, does a good congregational humanist need to be a post-structuralist social justice warrior? Good question. We do need to unpack this a little bit. Um, so we're talking about FUS type places. Um, post-structuralist is not a term we see all that often in the United States. It's used more in Europe uh, to describe uh, uh, philosophy. Post-structuralism is after structuralism. In the U.S., we usually call it post-modernism. Uh, post-structuralism is actually a, a subset of post-modernism, uh, very directly tied to Saussure and uh, some of the uh, uh, French and German theorists uh, from mid-20th century. Uh, but um, yeah, but it's a good question. Uh, do you have to be a postmodernist or a post-structuralist uh, to really understand uh, kind of the politics and, and the ways we talk about reality nowadays? 
Um, and social justice warrior, yes, uh, JW does indeed have a little bit of a, a negative connotation to it. Um, so uh, probably not that, but do we need to be, or, or are most people interested in some kind of social justice work? And I would say that the answer there uh, is it's according to uh, certainly your personality, uh, how everyone deals with these issues. Some people like to get out in the street. They feel like they're doing something. Some would rather uh, stay uh, home and work on uh, social media. Um, and uh, some folks would rather uh, bury their heads and really not think that much about it. But uh, so we're all a little different that way. But let's look at this as a question uh, from a historical viewpoint. This is a uh, a little uh, comic from back in the 1980s. Is someone you care about getting involved with post-structuralism? This poor woman on the phone says, my son has recently been using the term knowledge in the plural. Should I be worried? Knowledge is, yes, very postmodern, post-structuralist thing to say. Uh, says uh, this uh, uh, hotline person, unfortunately, this might be a symptom of reading Foucault. Refer to human nature in a conversation and observe your son's reaction. Uh, well, yes, because a Foucaultian, a post-structuralist or postmodernist, would say there is no such thing as human nature that is part of and parcel of postmodernist thinking. And I'll get back to that in a little bit. But yeah, you see what's going on here. Yeah, M Michel Foucault is probably the best known of the postmodernists uh, here in the United States. Um, uh, definitely did provide a way to talk about power, especially French uh, theorist. He did say this, people know what they do. Frequently, they know why they do what they do, but what they don't know is what what they do does. That's postmodernism, poststructuralism, in a nutshell, and that is that um, uh, we work in unconscious ways. We think we're doing a, one particular thing, but we haven't really studied out the consequences uh, politically, socially, uh, religiously, etc., of whatever our actions are. But that's classic postmodernism. And uh, uh, yeah, you have to say, wait a minute, uh, when you, and uh, yeah, I need to read that again before I'm really going to get it. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes, uh, uh, back in the day, uh, was definitely talking about post-structuralism. History is the fiction we invent to persuade ourselves that events are knowable and that life has order and direction. Hmm, says Tiger. Uh, let me think about that. That is a classic postmodernist view that actually history is just a big jumble of events. Um, and, and anyone who's going to go in and dig around and create some kind of history uh, is going to be doing that um, to try to pretend that there is a direction to history when an actual point of fact there is not. Um, in um, UU circles, we talk about bending the arc um, of history toward justice. Um, the postmodernists would say, no, you're not. That's, that's not happening. You can fool yourself if you want. Uh, but in actual point of fact, human history has no direction, never has, and never will. And, and that may be depressing in some ways, but Foucault would say, wait a minute, that when we get to that point, we can begin to look realistically about how human history actually works. Um, now, something that uh, came out this uh, week uh, for, in the New York Times is David Brooks. Many of you know him um, as an opinion writer for the New York Times. Um, he just came out with a little uh, opinion piece called, You Are Not Who You Think You Are. Wait a minute. David Brooks, a conservative, uh, you, know, you know, kind of a centrist conservative in the New York Times is saying, exactly what Foucault said in the 1970s. What's up with that? Well, the interesting thing is that um, the more, uh, the farther we get away from the beginnings of postmodernism, the more the world looks postmodern. Let me read just one of the things. You can certainly find this online, but Brooks says this about reason slash emotion. As you know, this is a big argument. Oh, reason, age of enlightenment, age of reason, da da da. And, oh, that's that's not emotional enough. Blah blah blah. He says this. It feels as if the rational brain creates and works with ideas, but that emotions sweep over us. 
But some neuroscientists, like Lisa Feldman Barrett of Northeastern University, argue that people construct emotions and thoughts, and there is no clear distinction between them. It feels as if we can use our faculty of reason to restrain our passions, but some neuroscientists doubt this is really what's happening. Furthermore, emotions assign value to things, so they are instrumental to reason, not separate from or opposed to it. Yeah, ah, that's what the postmodernists were saying back in the 1970s, um, but it does look like neuroscience is catching up with the postmodern view. Uh, by the way, if you want to, and I haven't read this, but I'm kind of thinking about getting it. Lisa Feldman Barrett is the neuroscientist that he mentions. Uh, she has seven and a half lessons about the brain, the world's first neuroscience beach read. It's available now. So if you need a beach read for the last bits of uh, summer, by golly, seven and a half lessons about the brain in which you will learn how emotions are made and how actually reason that much vaunted thing is really, that's another emotion that we have. And yeah, that's a very post-structuralist kind of idea to be thinking. Here's another one. Uh, this kind of statement simply wasn't available uh, to say before uh, postmodernism. Uh, this is Joyce Carol Oates, a novelist and poet. While there are women writers, there are not and have never been men writers. This is an empty category, a class without specimens. For the noun writer, the very verb writing always implies masculinity. Classic postmodern uh, view of how oppression works, that the category men, white men, is over there and is uh, in some way the norm, and everything else has to have uh, an adjective in front of it. You know, you have black writers, right? Um, gay writers uh, who are all not white men writers who are the norm. As Joyce Carol Oates says, you know, that let's look at that. Uh, that is just a very oppressive thing to be thinking. And that is a very postmodernist way of looking at it. Um, Angela Davis said radical simply means grasping things at the root. Very good idea, colorofchange.org, uh, a poster that you can get a hold of. And Angela Davis is really one of the uh, very central figures in postmodernism in the United States and how that has gone over time. And we're very much experiencing that today. I want to go back for a moment because post-structuralism, post-modernism has a huge intellectual background that goes back into European philosophy. And the main people to be looking at with this is the Frankfurt School. Uh, there's a little photo from an early class in the early part of the 20th century. Yes, there were women involved, Joyce Carol Oates, there were, but uh, of course the patriarchy of the time uh, edited them out uh, through uh, how we tell the history, except for a very few, like uh, uh, Hannah Arendt, who was able to sort of go around that, uh, that kind of erasure of women. But um, the Frankfurt School very much was a Marxist uh, organization um, and uh, some of the famous people. So Max Horkheimer, uh, you, who you'll see again in my slides, uh, came up with the term critical theory. When we talk about critical race theory, we're talking about a subset of the Frankfurt School and uh, what nowadays we would call neo-Marxism. But it very much is an idea that came out of the Frankfurt School, and that's why I'm taking a step back to think about this a little bit. It helps to really know where these terms come from and how they actually operate uh, in a larger uh, context. Theodore Adorno, who was Angela Davis's teacher, uh, invented the term culture industry. And uh, notice how we, we throw that term around these days. Oh, the cultural industry is creating blah, 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 blank, blank, blank. That's Theodore Adorno. That is the Frankfurt School. That is a Marxist or neo-Marxist way of framing the discussion. Uh, Herbert Marcuse, one-dimensional man. I've mentioned this before uh, in assemblies that, this, that uh, many people my age read Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man uh, in that, pro that purple mimeograph stuff because it was very much an underground essay about how capitalism creates one-dimensional people. 
uh, and it was quite large and big ba back in the day, but it's still very much part of our culture. And Jurgen Habermas, who is second generation, um, who invented the term public sphere, again, a term we throw around, not really understanding that it is a neo-Marxist uh, ideological term for grasping certain kinds of reality. But it's important to really kind of trace these things when we talk about, do you need to be a post-structuralist? Um, uh, yeah, well, you certainly are exposed to it, shall we say. Here's a little comic from online. What people afraid of cultural Marxism actually believe, gee, and this is Horkheimer speaking over on the left, gee, Theodore, what do you want to do tonight? And Ordorno says the same thing we do every night, Max Horkheimer, try to destroy Western civilization. And yeah, they are seen as the great Marxist thinkers who are still destroying Western civilization. Now, when we talk about Nazis, you know, we, we throw this term Nazi, Hitler, you know, around a lot. These guys, Hitler and the Nazis, actually did know about them. They were Jewish intellectuals in Germany, and uh, they were run out of the country, or they were smart enough to get out when the getting was good in the early 1930s, um, or else they would be uh, would have been dead pretty quickly uh, in the uh, mid 1930s. Uh, so this is very much part of a uh, anti-fascist, uh, pro-socialist, Marxist way of thinking. Uh, another person, you probably hey, it's Labor Day, so we ought to think about this, the pedagogy of the oppressed. Paulo Freire was not a member of the Frankfurt School, but very much comes out of that. Uh, he's South American. He says, washing one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless means to side with the powerful, not to be neutral. And again, this is very much a part of the, what the Frankfurt School will be saying. You, you can't be neutral. Uh, if you think you're neutral, you're going with the status quo. You're going with the existing oppressions that are going on. And again, that's part of what we're talking about here. Uh, if you want to read up on this stuff, it's great fun. I, I think I really enjoy it. Anyway, the idea of critical theory, Habermas and the Frankfurt School. So again, uh, critical ra race theory is something that's very hot these days in American conversation, but there's all kinds of critical theories. Uh, and my, my favorite book, if you really want to catch up on these uh, these people from the early 20th century is Grand Hotel Abyss, The Lives of the Frankfurt School by Stuart Jeffries. Um, it's a fun book to read if you're into to, um, early 20th century politics and uh, into uh, uh, European philosophy as it comes into the U.S. because these Frankfurt School folks ran either to France or Great Britain or the United States when they were running away from the Nazis. And these ideas become the baseline uh, for much of the sociological thinking in the United States the next few years. Um, this is Theodore Adorno uh, and his student Angela Davis in the late 1960s. Um, they, uh, she was one of his star pupils and this is how uh, the Frankfurt School ties into uh, the uh, postmodernism and critical race theory that we see nowadays. She said this about studying with Ordorno. Uh, During one of my last meetings with him, he suggested that my desire to work directly in the radical movements of that period was akin to a media studies scholar deciding to become a radio technician. Uh, and that's classic Frankfurt School that, you know, we're just going to think about these things. We're actually not going to get out in the street and, and get our feet dirty. Um, because that's for other people. We are uh, the intellectuals. Uh, and uh, Angela Davis said, you know, that's just not going to cut it for African Americans here in the United States. And so you probably know that how the story was working out slightly after that. She becomes the one of the FBI's most wanted people. Um, and this feeds in then to the larger discussion um, of uh, the right wing uh, about what does uh, critical theory in general, what does the Frankfurt School thinkers mean? This is a, not a nice poster, but you can indeed find this meme on the web uh, from uh, neo-Nazis here in the United States. Uh, Max Horkheimer, again, uh, part of the, the uh, Frankfurt School. Uh, yes, that's a Star of David on his forehead, and they quote him, and he did really say this, the revolution won't happen with guns, 
Rather, it will happen incrementally, year by year, generation by generation. We will gradually infiltrate their educational institutions and their political offices, transforming them slowly into Marxist entities as we move towards universal egalitarianism. Uh, so that's being framed here by neo-Nazis as a bad thing. And you see how uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, critical race theory, uh, and good old-fashioned hatred of Marxism are going to get conflated uh, here in the U.S. Um, it says here, Max Horkheimer was one of the leading Jewish Marxists of the Frankfurt School, which pioneered cultural Marxism. And as you know, a Nazi and neo-Nazi belief is that there is a, um, a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world, as uh, the little uh, earlier little cartoon was talking about. But we do need to remember that these things have not disappeared in the mind of the super right. Uh, the actual fascists of America, um, it, the ideas of the Frankfurt School um, in their many variations are very much part of the uh, enemy um, as they go forward. So to look at, okay, do, do we have to be social justice warriors if we want to be humanists? Well, I'm going back to the first humanist manifesto back in 1933 that said religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Now, wait a minute, that doesn't have anything to do with politics or not, does it? Well, well wait a minute. Here's their second point. Humanism believes that man, humans, um, is a part of nature and that we, he, has emerged as a result of a continuous process, evolution, natural selection. And holding an organic view of life, humanists find that their traditional dualism of mind and body must be rejected. And I'll skip to the end. We assert that humanism will... A, affirm life rather than deny it. That sounds okay, right? Uh, B, select to seek to elicit the possibilities of life, not free, flee from them. And C, endeavor to establish the conditions of a satisfactory life for all, not merely the few. By this positive morale and intention, humanism will be guided. And from this perspective and alignment, the techniques and efforts of humanism will flow. So in the first Humanist Manifesto, most of the writers uh, uh, were indeed uh, pragmatist philosophers uh, of one sort or another, um, and they were also, for the most part, democratic socialists, or they, the, the U.S. is then going into the New Deal period. So they very much believe that government should be involved in the good of the people and getting the oppression out of human lives. This built, that was baked into the first Humanist Manifesto. Uh, this is Humanist Manifesto 3, the one that the most on it says this. Humanists are concerned for the well-being of all, are committed to diversity, and respect those of differing yet humane views. We work to uphold the equal enjoyment of human rights and civil liberties in an open, secular society and maintain it as a a civic duty to participate in the democratic process and a planetary duty to protect nature's integrity, diversity, and beauty in a secure, sustainable manner. So, yeah, humanism in its kind of germ self is definitely oriented towards at least what we would call a center-left position because we tend to believe that a government needs to be involved to stop oppressions of various kinds and to uh, help those who um, uh, cutthroat capitalism would destroy in some way. So there is an activist element to humanism all the way back. Uh, that also goes into Unitarian Universalism, or comes out of it rather, uh, with the, uh, the social gospel movement. Uh, that occurred in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that was also a very a center-left kind of, uh, of uh, uh, movement. Uh, if you look at the website, the American Humanist Association today, you will see them advocating, prog advocating progressive values and equality for humanists, atheists, and free thinkers. And three of their little programs going on now tell Congress to take the next step on reparations. Uh, that, be, that would be for racial justice. Tell Congress to enact evidence-based election reforms. That would be sort of anti-Trump. And tell Congress to raise the minimum wage. Very much a Labor Day kind of idea. So, yeah, 
there is a direct line uh, that we can trace from uh, the uh, early 20th century uh, European ideas uh, that are declared dangerous and destroyed in Nazi Germany uh, that do trace all the way into the U.S. Uh, through immigration uh, and definitely does inform uh, the way that many progressives and liberals do think today. Now, maybe we don't examine that enough, but there is a direct line that we do need, I think, to be aware of to really understand what we even think. You know, it's easy to kind of get it out of by osmosis out of the water, but then we miss the fact that, oh, wait a minute, why in Texas are uh, they so against critical race theory in uh, high school history classes? Well, it's because they have uh, read the neo-Nazi material that tells us that that is part of the Jewish conspiracy to destroy America. Uh, so it's not a mystery to many of our right-wing friends uh, exactly what we're talking about there, in their minds anyway. Uh, last question uh, well, I got today, and that is, what's it all about? Uh, yeah, so, you know, we... we it, that's a good question for us always to think about, but I do think it's maybe uh, not the right question to ask um, because I don't think it's about anything. And I think that, again, if you go back to that first humanist manifesto, that's part of what they're going to tell us. Hey, it's just here. Uh, it happened by natural selection. Uh, you know, the universe is self-creating, so it's not about anything. Uh, so that's not a very good question, maybe. Um, again, he really just humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. If God didn't create it with a plan, why is the universe here? Um, one of the subjective ways of looking at that is, what's, what's it all about to me? I think that's a valid question. Uh, or a little less subjective, what am I all about to it? Which is maybe... Uh, the larger question uh, that we need to be asking if we want to talk about being in some way responsible as citizens of uh, the community of the nation and also the world. So I do want to point out, though, that uh, where one of the places I think that New Age thinking gets involved too much in the way Americans talk about the meaning of existence is this. We have the consciousness of consciousness. That's just the way it is for us. We are conscious of being conscious. We don't know how many other animals uh, have the consciousness of being conscious. Um, the ability to know that our consciousness will stop uh, eventually or that it came into being uh, when we were born. Uh, so uh, that is a metaphysical basis that humanism then begins to move away from. Uh, and, and also we have to remember that having a consciousness of consciousness is different from the idea of improving the consciousness of consciousness, which is what we generally talk about, uh, especially in New Age circles. I'm going to improve your consciousness by, by selling you this book. I'm going to improve your consciousness by uh, putting you through this exercise program. I'm going to improve your consciousness by hooking you up to this machine. That is not the same as an awareness of being conscious. As a matter of fact, it's diagnosing a problem of consciousness that is or isn't true. Uh, and we do need to ask that, uh, that selves of ourselves, I think. So I, here are some better questions I want to leave you with today. What am I all about to it? What am I all about to the universe? And what might I do about that if I am something all about it? Again, my answer kind of is, hey, you're here, I'm here, and probably I do need to be responsible to other living things and the planet because it sure is a gift to be here, isn't it? It's kind of fun sometimes. Um, and what might I do about that? And that's what I will invite you to go picnicking on today if you're going to be out uh, doing some picnicking with uh, our fellow creatures there. What might I do about the fact of my existence? Um, and I think that despite the kind of odd misturnings of progressive politics and progressive thinking and all those things, I think that still... It, it's not 
it's, it's not a question that we can improve our way of living for everybody. Um, if we try, we can work toward that goal anyway, even if history doesn't exist, as Calvin and Hobbes would say. But we can work toward that and try to do the, the better for today. Uh, the mega narratives may or may not be there. Uh, the the uh, arc of justice may or may not uh, be bending toward any kind of justice or better world. We don't know those things. But what we do know is that I'm here. I'm lucky to be here. Uh, I can use that great privilege to help uh, other living things and the planet itself. And that is what I think humanism is really, totally, and actually about. So thank you very much for joining in today. I'm always open to questions. You can certainly uh, uh, send me uh, questions. Thanks to, to those who did uh, send in some questions I could kind of work around today. Um, and I want you to have a really, really fine um, uh, holiday weekend. Again, no social or coffee hour today. We'll, I'll just sign off and yeah, please go have your picnic and think about the meaning of life. Thanks a lot for joining in today, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.